you that have had a birthday or an anniversary, come on and we want to sing to you. We'll put your name in the drawing for the three-wheel bike. Both of you. Anybody else? Kate had a birthday. She turned one. Sister Arlene, this is wonderful. Anna Kate had a big birthday party. She may be in the nursery. All right. These three youngins here have a birthday. Sing with us. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. And happy birthday. God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Only one will not do. A born again. birthday. Good morning and we're, welcome to the house of the Lord. Good to see your smiling faces this morning. Uh, be in prayer. Brother Will is away in Indiana at Terry Hines Church and I believe he's with his brother Sean. So they're, uh, they're both preaching up there this weekend. So you be in prayer for them. We are blessed to have Brother David Crow with us today. So we're excited for what the Lord's going to do today. Yes, give him a hand. If you are visiting with us today, we would like to give you a little goodie bag, uh, something to share with you with some information about the church and that. So if you are a visitor today, if you could slip up your hand, one of our ushers will get to you with, with a bag with some goodies in it. We've got one up here, fellas, towards the front. One there in the back, yes. Right over here on the side, Brother Nelson, by Miss Gina. Anybody else? Anybody up top? All right. Well, we are glad to have everyone with us this morning. If you'll grab a songbook and stand to your feet, Ron will lead us in praise to the Lord this morning. Page 240. Page 240, when the roll, this is oldie oldie, when the roll is called up yonder, I'm glad I'm going to be there. Thank God for the grace of the Lord Jesus. Are you happy? Amen. You're looking good. This side's happy. I don't know about this side. On the prayers, when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, time shall be no more. When the morning breaks, eternal bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore. Singing now, I want to hear you. When the roll is called to be yonder, when the roll is called to be yonder, when the roll is called to be yonder, when the roll is called. Are you singing? On the second, on that bright and cloudless morning, when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection. When the chosen one shall gather together And the roll is called Help me out now, sing with me Oh, when the roll is called of yonder When the roll is called of yonder When the roll, sing it now, is called of yonder When the roll, sing it again now, turn around, shake hands when the roll is called of yonder, when the roll is called of yonder, when the roll is called of yonder, when the roll is called of yonder. Let us labor for the master from the dawn to the setting sun. Let us talk of all his Sing 
singing now. Oh, and the road is called up yonder. When the road is called up yonder. When the road is called up yonder. When the road is called. One more time, singing. When the road is called up yonder. When the road is called up yonder. morning's tithes and offerings as we sing this old song that I love. Um, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fire. Sing it now. Cleansed by his blood. Joined heirs with Jesus as we travel the sun. For I'm The family, sing the first verse. You might notice we say brother and sister round here. Why, it's because we're a family and these folks are so dear. When one has a heartache, then we all share the tears and rejoice in each in this family so sing it now i'm so glad i'm a part of the family of god i've been washed in the fountain cleansed by his blood joined heirs with jesus as we travel request uh, today. I know that Sister Ruth got to come home, so we're thanking God for that. And pray for Brother Ron as he helps take care of her. And then Sister Ann Nelson has a, a, um, a catheterization, heart cath on Tuesday. Remember that? Some of the others, I um, forgot. Kind of bad, isn't it? Jo yes, Joanne has surgery this week too. Amen. All right, are we ready to pray? Ed Drum, pray for us, please.
will be the leading one at that meeting in the air. Now you have heard of little Moses and the bulrush. You have heard of fearless David and his sling. You have heard the story told of dreaming Joseph and of Jonah and the whale. Gonna say hello, then renew acquaintance with the ones I know. I'm gonna take a stroll along the streets of gold. Gonna look at those mansions grand. God's people. I like to go. Uh, when I was younger, I think I, I went a little more, but uh, it's been good. Been a good run. God's been good to us and blessed us and with all of you. We love you. You know that, don't you? Two. These over here do. They know. I, maybe you don't know. <laughs> but it's been good, and it's good to have Brother David, really, Dr. David Crow, and I guess he, if anybody deserves the the title that he's the one he's he's really good as a preacher he's good as a man he's been steadfast and i've heard him preach some brother just recently brother david i think i don't know who it was but saying the the <laughs> best message ever and so we're thanking god yes i still remember lifting up the the grapes and the grapes. <laughs> <laughs> good don't you love god's people amen i appreciate the good preachers man that we've got and we've got them and we thank the lord for the work that they do. Give me that F again. In the church house this morning, Lord, you spoke to me. And you said, child, remember how good I've been to thee. Oh, there's blessings you've noticed, but there's some you've ignored. So I sat down all that I'm grateful for One of Hoy's songs And I try to recall Just as much as I could And I wrote down my blessings Like a grateful man should Oh, but when I was finished Lord For all I had written, there was still so much more. Lord, it's not just your mercy, it's not just your grace, it's not just that city I live in.
suffer not just the valleys that you brought us through not just those healings God, that right. we watched you do and it's not just the blessings This for me, yet there's still so much more. And it's not just your mercy, it's not just your grace, it's not just that city I live in one day, it's not just my family. forget um, mom had lost her vision and this is what I thought of Ronald because he's he's forgetting but I well everybody knows that <laughs> but anyway I was thinking of mom when she came to church she she had lost her vision and she had her dress on wrong side out and of course the devil told her you old woman you just need to stay home you don't even have enough sense to and you know what? She said, I had to pray. And then I said, if I wear my dress upside down, I'm going to the house of God. And you know what? The devil will try anything. And I just want to yeah. thank him and praise him for the services that I've been in. Uh, we got to go to Sean's camp meeting. and it, The spirit couldn't have been better. And the preaching couldn't have been better. And you know what was a real blessing to me? Being with my grandchildren in church and I don't take that for granted because I know some of yours aren't in church but that don't mean they won't be and uh, I uh, one of the preachers says if you've got and I do have lost loved ones that I pray for he said if you've got lost loved ones that you want saved come and pray so I went up and when I looked up here was my two big six foot grandson <laughs> around me with tears just weeping yeah, and I, I praise God yeah, for that right. I'm so thankful they experienced the spirit of God in these last days yeah. and I want to be close to the Lord I want to love him more and serve him more <laughs> and you know I've been asking God Lord because so some, sometimes as you get older you get critical you get kind of hateful and I thought Lord I want the love you had for people and I want that love to stay in me if, if it's not going to be there you take me on out that I won't be a hindrance mm. I want to be a blessing to people and I praise God for his blessings I thank him and I told the boys as I was hugging them around the altar I said boys do you know how many times mamma has prayed for you Absolutely. and God day, has protected day. you from the evil one that's tried to take you out and I, Garrett was one of them, and one I had a had a bad dream. And I, you say I don't believe in dreams. Well, I do, if they're from God. But and I and I had an unsettled feeling. So I called Sean and I called Karen actually, and I said, Karen, I had this bad feeling, and I woke up and started praying. I pray the blood of Jesus. I pray that Lord release your angels around him. And she said, Well, it's funny you called because Garrett. His car got hit tonight, mm. and she said a couple hours later, here comes a car straight from me, and she said all of a sudden it veered and hit another car. Now, you don't tell me that God <laughs> doesn't warn you, and God, but I want to stay close to God, that he would warn me yes. about the things of Satan's got after our people, not just my family, about you. I praise the Lord for his blessings. I thank him from the bottom of my heart for when I was saved that my mom and dad had enough sense 
to take us to God's house and make that the most important thing. We was took to church. Lord, we was took to church so many times. I didn't regret it. I've woke up many times in the truck going home sound asleep on the front rows or whatever. It didn't hurt us. It did not hurt us. And I thank the Lord that I had parents. And you know, the scripture says, a lot was given to me growing up. To whom much is given, much is required. More will be required of me than those that's been on the streets never having training. But I thank the Lord for his blessings. And I praise him for a godly mom and dad and for children that want to obey the Lord yes. for sons that want to preach the gospel. Yes. And I heard a preacher talking, it might have been yesterday, talking about how many preachers are quitting and their wives are saying, we don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> Can you imagine, yeah. would you want to be one of those that causes them to stumble and not even want to be a God's used of God? But you know what? I'm not in this for y'all. I'm in this because Jesus saved me when I was yeah. five years old. Yeah, yeah. He saved my family. And I praise him and I thank God and Johnny, Ace, yeah. Kevin, yeah. all of them. I pray for them every night. Yes. I'm proud of them and I They're love good. them. They're good. I love them and I thank God that he has called them to the ministry. And I want to be a blessing and encouragement to them. And I thank the Lord for all of his blessings. I can't thank him enough for saving me, for taking, keeping me in this church all these years. We've yeah. got to be together. And the Lord has been so good, and I want to praise him today. Yes. And I want to thank him for everything he's done for me. Only the Lord could do the things he's done for me, and I praise his holy name today. Amen. My wife said try to redeem yourself. And so, Hoy, if you're watching... Uh, I'm sorry on that, but I'll try to help on this. And, and I got, listen here, I got cousins in West Virginia. If you're watching, yeah. we love you. We thank yeah. God for you. Praise this God. is Hoyt. Lord, it's me again today. Yeah. Feeling hopeless and afraid. And these trials, they're too much for me to bear. My heart's been broken in two. Lord, I'm crying out to you. But it feels like I can't find you anywhere. Thank you, Lord. That when a voice so tenderly began speaking unto me, saying, Child, you know that I'm your dearest friend. Faithful to your house, Lord, to my call. 
pleased to have our guest speaker, Dr. David Crow, with us this morning. Um, I've been told he has preached at over 1,200 Free Will Baptist churches. Amen. Amen. And I'm glad he's with us yeah. this morning. Give him a hand as he comes. Yeah. Mute here. We, we have power. All right. Why don't you go ahead and be turning with me your Bibles to John chapter 6, please. Gospel of John, chapter 6. It is good to be. I always enjoy being in Sefner. It's good to be with you to this service this morning, then this evening at 6. I think we have a service, and uh, I need your prayers. I'm, uh, I've am i been a little bit everywhere in the last month and a half. I've been to California twice, uh, Fresno, Bakersfield, Wasco, Salinas, San Jose, uh, you know, and then I just came from northwest Alabama to here last night. Uh, and I think I get to go home tomorrow, actually. So I'm kind of excited about that. But it's, it's just good to be with you. I, I always enjoy your music. Uh, one thing, you sing songs I recognize. Yes, sir. Amen, brother. Thank you. Yeah. I hear a little bit of everything yeah. when it comes to music. Some of it I enjoy, some of it I endure. But uh, I, I hear a little all of it, you know. It's just, just uh, it's good, to hear, good to be here and be a part and hear the music that, that you have here. So many talented people. We'll get right into the message this morning. Did, you, you didn't drink out of this, did you, Brother Ryan? <laughs> you know, we all, have, we all have some quirks, right? Now, don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. You've got some quirks, too, okay? We Some just have more than others. One of mine, I won't drink after anybody. I, my, my dad doesn't drink after anybody. He didn't drink after my mom. Didn't drink after my brother, my sister, me. And I got that. I don't, drink after, I don't drink after my kids. I don't drink after my wife, Kathy. Somebody said, you don't drink after your wife? Said, That's right. I said, do you kiss her? I said, now, wait a minute. Kiss and drinking is two different things. <laughs> Kissing's worth the risk, amen? <laughs> and about this doctor business, it's, uh, you know, it's not something I necessarily advertise. I, I had a guy came up to me one day. He said, somebody told me you've got a doctor's degree. Is that true? I said, well, I don't necessarily advertise it, but yeah, I do. And he says, is it earned? I said, well, I said, yes, sir, for your information, it, it is earned. As a matter of fact, I have two earned doctorates. I said, by the way, you know what you call a redneck with two earned doctorates? He said, what? I said, that'd be a paradox. <laughs> you guys get your wife to explain it to you when you get home. John chapter 6. I love this chapter. It's one of my favorite chapters in all the Bible. I love the story of the little boy and his lunch. One of the most famous little boys in Sunday school, and we don't even know his name. But we know about him, and we know about his lunch, don't we? Look in verse 1. It says, After these things Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him, because they saw his miracles, which he did on them, that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he said unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now, let me stop right there just a moment. Right. Every time, do a study sometime of all the questions Jesus asked in the Bible. Yeah. Let me tell you what you'll discover. Yeah. Jesus never one time asked a question to learn something. Yeah. He's a son of God. He already knows. He, he every, always asked a question that he might teach something. Boy, he's about to teach a wonderful lesson this day, isn't he? Verse 7, or verse 6, And this he said to prove or test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. Then one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? I want to just share with you what I just simply call this morning lessons from a little boy's lunch on how to meet the needs of a multitude. 
What a wonderful, wonderful account in the life of Christ we find here. And if you'd allow me this morning for just a little while, I want us to look a little deeper into that little boy's lunch. I want to share with you three very simple things about his lunch. Now, I like simple. Jesus taught in simple terms. He, he wanted people to be sure people understood it. I, I like simple. The problem is sometimes people equate simple with stupid. Not the same. Now, I've got some pastor friends that, that they think they have a gift. They, their gift is to take that which is simple and make it complicated. Listen, that's not the gift. The gift is to take that which is complicated and make it simple or take that which is simple and keep it simple. I like the way Jesus taught it. And here, I want you three very simple things about this little boy's lunch. Number one, I want you to consider with me the amount of his lunch. Was it enough to meet the needs of the multitude that day? Well, let's get it in perspective. The Bible tells us there were 5,000 men. Now, we know there's one little boy because Jesus brings him to, I mean, Andrew brings him to Jesus. So if there's one little boy, there are probably other children in that crowd. And if there are children in that crowd, you can rest assured there are some mothers in that crowd. Because I don't know many dads going to get very far out of town with the kids without mom along to watch them. So there's 10 to 15,000 people in this multitude that's come out to hear Jesus. And when Jesus sees them, he sees their great need. He sees that he understands they'll be hungry by the time they've walked from their homes where he is, by the time he ministers, by the time they return back to their homes, a long period of time's going to pass. They're going to be hungry. And so then he asked Philip, he said, how are we going to feed that crowd? Yeah. You know, Philip's response, he got overwhelmed. He looked at that multitude of people and thought about it. He, well, Lord, 200 penny worth of bread would not be sufficient. Can I suggest, I, I, I doubt they had that much money to buy that much bread. And so Philip's response, he got overwhelmed. I'm afraid that's the response many churches are making today. As we look around us, all around us today, no matter where you place yourself in this world, all around us are multitudes of people with multitudes of needs. And if we're not careful, we can, as a church, we can see those multitudes of needs and think, well, our church could never meet all those needs. How could we? And so many times we just do like Philip, we just get overwhelmed and do nothing. But I like Andrew. That some people call him ordinary Andrew because you know you don't see him doing the, the loud things like the sons of thunder and, and the miraculous things. But let me tell you about Andrew. Every time you find Andrew in the Bible, guess what? He's bringing somebody to Jesus. Listen, that's my kind of disciple. And he goes, and apparently he hears, hears what Jesus asked Philip, and he goes into the crowd. He begins to see what resources might be available for Jesus to use. And so he searches through the crowd. He comes back to Jesus with that one little boy and that one little lunch. Yeah. And as he holds it in his hands, is it enough to meet the needs of the multitude? Yeah. Well, in his lunch, the Bible says he had five barley loaves. Now, let's get that in perspective. Right. Barley loaves. Now, that was not a long loaf of bread as we understand bread today. It was a small, round loaf, more like a, a muffin. Or, 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 let me just use terms I believe we all can get. Yeah. He had five barley biscuits, what he had. Right. Now, I know you know what a biscuit is. Come on. Had one or two, right? <laughs> Fine barley biscuits. And the Bible says two small fish. Now, when I try to picture those fish, I don't envision two big old Tennessee catfish that had been battered and deep fried, and one of them by itself would cover an oval plate. I, I envision more like two sardines. It's a little boy's lunch. So he's got five barley biscuits, two sardines. There's ten to 15,000 hungry people. Is that enough to meet the needs of the multitude? Well, as long as he holds it in his hands, it'll never come close. Amen. Oh, by the way, as long as he holds it in his hands, it'll not even meet his own needs for long. We have two children, our, da our daughter, Nicole, is the oldest, and then we have a son, Ryan, who's uh, be 31 in a few months. And Ryan, listen, when that boy was 10, 11, 12 years old, he could have swallowed five biscuits and two sardines in about one breath and been ready for the main course. <laughs> well, he's going to meet his own needs for long, much less the needs of that multitude, yeah. as long as he held it in his hands. But the Bible tells us he put it in Jesus' hands. He didn't give it some of it. He gave him most of it. He didn't give him the majority of it. He didn't keep it and keep some back from it. He gave all of it. He put it all in Jesus' hands. Wow, is it now enough to meet the needs of the multitude? Not only has it become enough, we know the rest of the story, don't we? It's now become more than enough. Because we know how that Jesus, as he's holding it in his hands now, the Bible tells us he blessed it. He thanked his father for it. He broke it. He told the disciples to sit the people in groups upon the ground and, and bestowed it to them and said, now start passing it out. And I don't know how you study the Bible, but when I study God's Word, I try to imagine that I'm there. I try to imagine what I'm seeing, what I'm hearing, and I'm, I'm trying to think, I'm one of Jesus' disciples, and, and I'm there. And, and now Jesus has just broken five biscuits and two sardines into enough pieces to put pieces in mine and 11 other disciples' hands. 
You know what you're holding? Yeah. Crumbs. Yeah. Right. Now Jesus <laughs> says, pass it out. Now I can almost see Peter. Uh, come on, old boisterous, bold, bold, rude sometimes, crude Peter. I, I mean, can almost see him looking at the crumbs in his hands and the multitude. Of Don't you know he's thinking, pass it out. Well, just these few people here in front to get these crumbs, it'll be gone, and the rest of the crowd, see, they got something they did. Have you ever been, you, you talked about a lot of meetings a while ago. We, we, I, the, most, the meeting we like to go to more than anything is the eating meeting. <laughs> Have you ever been to an eating meeting where they ran out of food before they did people? Vicious crowd, let me just tell you right now. <clears throat> but, but they knew better than to question Jesus, so they start passing it out. They, keep pass, they can't get rid of it. They keep passing it out. The Bible says they pass it out that day, not till almost everybody, not till most of them. It says they pass it out until everyone there had eaten, not just a taste, not just a bite, not just a morsel, not just a sample. They had all eaten until they were filled full. They were full. That's a lot of bread and fish. Especially if there's many Baptists in that crowd. That's a lot of bread and fish. Now Jesus says, we don't want to be wasteful, so you go pick up what's left. Right. Again, don't you know everything? <laughs> pick up what's left. We never thought, but they go. The Bible says they bring 12 baskets full left over. After everybody there ate until they were full. That's 12 baskets. How many, how many disciples? 12. How many baskets per disciple is that? One, thank you. Glad they're still teaching math in Florida. <laughs> <clears throat> That's one basket of faith per disciple that day because Jesus is trying to drive home a truth in their hearts and minds. It's a truth that God tried to teach Israel all throughout the Old Testament. It's a truth that Jesus tried to instill in his disciples. It's a truth he wants us to understand today, and it's simply this, that little is much when you give it all to God. Amen. The amount of it, was it enough? In his own hands, not close. But the moment he put it in Jesus' hands, took his hands off, it immediately became more than enough. Can I just tell you, since that night, January the 5th, 1978, when my wife and I got up from that altar and that revival meeting, listen, it's been this coming January the 5th to be 40 years. 40 years I got right with the Lord in that altar and answered a call to preach in that altar for that same evening before I got out of that altar. And it's been nearly 40 years now. Can I just tell you, we put everything we had, everything we were and ever hoped to be in Jesus' hands that night, and we left it there. And the, listen, the leftovers of our life, have been more than God ever, we ever put in his hands to start with. The leftovers are more than we ever gave him to start with. That's the way God works. The amount, was it enough? The second thing, the adequacy of his lunch. Not only was it enough, was it good enough to meet the needs of the most? Have you ever thought about this? Now, I never had. Let me tell you why I did. Several years ago, I was doing a study on the types of food that people ate at the time Jesus lived on the earth in that part of the world. And this is what I discovered, that in Jesus' time in that part of the world, most people did not eat bread made out of barley. As a matter of fact, most people used barley to feed their animals. Only the very poorest of the society of yes, Jesus' sir. day yes, ate bread made from barley. Amen. So when I saw that, immediately I, I realized I just learned something about that little boy I didn't know before. He had to come from the poorest of society. If it, listen, and Palestine was the poorest of all the, of all the, in all the Roman Empire. They were the poorest. But he would have been of the poorest families even in the poorest province. Yeah. So I know he came from the poorest of, yeah. of, of society. Yeah. Now I want you to imagine with me who all is in that crowd. Yeah. I'm pretty sure there's some doctors there. If for no other reason to come and see this man that they have heard has made the lame to walk and the blind to see. I'm sure there's some lawyers in that crowd. If for no other reason to come and hear this great lawgiver speak. Yeah. I'm pretty convinced there's some Pharisees and Sadducees, scribes, elders, and priests. All of these would have been the elite of the society of Jesus' day. They would have been there for no other reason to hear Jesus say something, see him do something they might accuse him of. Wouldn't it have been easy for that little boy sitting there and he sees somebody coming and he looks and he's pretty sure that's one of Jesus' disciples. But maybe he'd seen him with Jesus before. It's Andrew. What is he asking? Yeah. So he gets closer. Did anybody bring any food? If you brought food, would you give it to Jesus and let him use it to meet the needs of this multitude? Wouldn't it have been easy for that little boy to look into his lunch of barley, bread, and fish? 
and think, you know, I'd, I'd like to give Jesus what I have. What I have is not good enough. Why, these people don't eat bread made out of barley. Right, right. This is what they feed their animals. Yeah. Well, they'd be offended by what I have. But whatever went through his mind, I'm glad he made the choice to give his lunch to Jesus that day. But can I just tell you, Satan uses that lie to keep more people from serving Christ than anything I know. He says to me and he says to you, what you have is not good enough for Jesus to use. What you have it would be an embarrassment to Jesus. You'd be an embarrassment to others. He can't use you. What you have is not good enough. Now, I want to share with you why this is so important to me. All my life, you understand, as far back as I have memories into my childhood, <clears throat> I've had some nervous twitches. Now, growing up in rural northwest Alabama, in the 60s as a child, in the 70s as a teenager, they didn't understand a lot about those things. And uh, other children can be uh, real cruel about those kind of things. And when I was a child, a teenager, it came out more in my face, my mouth, and, and my neck, which <clears throat> made it a whole lot more noticeable. And, you know, they'd mock and make fun of me. And, and sometimes even adults can be kind of cruel about those kind of things. I remember my dad took me to a doctor. I was about 14 years old. <clears throat> took me to a doctor and see if they could do something to make it stop. And, and the doctor examines me, and then with me sitting there in front of me, he tells my dad, he says, Mr. Crow, he says, uh, he says just a nervous habit. Yeah. If he really wanted to, he could stop. What I wish I could have helped him understand is I'd have given everything I owned to stop. So I grew up with a very severe inferiority complex, a lot of issues. I couldn't look somebody eye to eye and have a conversation. They, they, weren't, looking, they weren't listening to what I'd say. They were watching those, those ticks, ticks they called them now. I knew when I was 11 years old God wanted me to be a preacher. I knew with, with all that was in me. But the problem was, I started running when I was 11 years old. And I ran all my teenage life. I didn't get out of church. Uh, we st sister was talking about going to church. And Listen, my father, Harold Crow, he gave me, my brother and sister, he gave us a choice about going to church. We, we could go to church or die. <laughs> I'm here so you know what choice I made. <clears throat> But I, I was running from God, and I thought all oh, those years that I was running from him because I didn't want to be a preacher. I mean, you know, I was 11 years old. My pastor was a great man, good man. He's just so dignified and stiff. And... I mean, he may have had a sense of humor. We just never saw it. We would drive past his house in the summertime in the heat and humidity of northwest Alabama, and he'd be mowing his grass with his long sleeve white dress shirt on and his tie. Push bow. I say, Daddy, can he take that tie off? I thought when you became a preacher, they put a tie on you, and you never got to take it off. I figured he slept in it. I didn't know if Miss Dixie had ever seen him with it off or not, his wife. So I thought I was running because I didn't want to be a preacher. But when I got into my teenage, into my, out of my teenage years, into my 20s, I started preaching at 19 years of age. I finally quit running from him and came to my right mind one night and ran to him. And I realized as I thought about the dynamics of my teenage life, why I was like I was, I wasn't running because I didn't want to be a preacher. I was running because I really did want to be a preacher. But I just couldn't imagine Jesus could use somebody like me. What could he do with what I had? I couldn't talk to somebody one-on-one, -on -one, much less get up in front of a group of people and say anything. Why would he want somebody like me? But I'm so glad that when I didn't want him, he wanted me. Yeah. I'm so glad that when I didn't love him, he loved me. Yeah. I'll never get over that he wanted me. Yeah. Praise God. Bless you. For, all, for, for over 38 years, you hear me? Yeah. For over 38 years now as a preacher, almost every day of my life I prayed and asked God to take this, these Thank ticks away. I was finally diagnosed when I was in my 30s by a doctor. I have a mild case of Tourette's syndrome, and yeah. that's what the, the, the problem is. And, and um, for over 38 years, I begged God to take it away. You ever try to talk God into stuff? 
Now, maybe you're more spiritual than I am. You don't do that. I, I try to help him a little bit. You know, I, I pray, now, Lord, don't you think I'd much, be much more effective if you take that away? And Lord, I, I, I mean, Lord, I'm, I'm a director of a national department now. Lord, I, I'm in meetings with bank presidents and college presidents. And, and, and I, I'm up in front large. God, don't you think I could be a better preacher? Over 38 years, I asked him every day to take it away. But can I tell you how good God is? Over the years, I've met many people who have Tourette's in our churches across the country. Most of them teenagers. Most of them young men and some teenage young ladies. <clears throat> and let me tell you how good God is. <laughs> when they wouldn't listen to anybody else, when they wouldn't listen to any other preacher, they'd listen to me. And I could look them in the eyes and say to them, you don't have to let this define who you are. Put it in God's hands. Take your hands off and let God define who you are. You can make something of your life. You don't have to let this defeat you, whatever it may be. Can I tell you how good God is? People ask me, brother, why do you preach like you preach? I mean, I mean, Especially now, you're a director of a national, you're an executive director of a national department. You got a doctor. Why do you preach like you? You're kind of loud. You're kind of emotional. Kind of mobile. Now, trust me, not everybody likes loud, emotional, and mobile preaching. Oh, I know it's no problem here. <laughs> yeah. So I tell folks, hey, well, how do you preach? You don't preach like a lot of folks we know in those kind of positions. All I know to tell them is, you know, when I really get to preaching, I mean, it's just, sometimes it's just easy. Sometimes God just putting it in and it just flows. I mean, sometimes it's just easy. And when that starts happening and I really get going, oh, listen, you don't know if it's twitch or preach. That's how good God is. But a year or so ago, something happened that has changed the way I pray about this. I got on, I boarded a plane. It was a Delta flight. I fly Delta. I went over 2 million miles just a few months ago on Delta. And uh, I tell people I'm, I'm close to becoming a chaplain of Delta Airlines. I fly them so much. <laughs> they call me pastor at the Delta Sky Club at the airport, Nash, uh, National Airport. And, and uh, one, one, you, listen, you know you're traveling too much when a Delta employee retires and you get invited to the thing. <laughs> <clears throat> traveling too much. But... Uh, I boarded this plane, and because I fly Delta so much, I have unlimited first-class upgrades. It doesn't cost anything. It just, it's just something they do for their frequent flyers. And so I, I was on the second row of first class, and this guy comes on the plane. Big, tall guy. had this cowboy hat and this big old, big old western belt buckle. Now, I used to wear those, but then when they became a potholder, I had to stop. But... <laughs> <clears throat> And had on his cowboy boots, and he's and he's talking, and, and he's loud, and he's obnoxious, and he's rude, and he's crude. And I look, and he's not talking to anybody; he's just talking. Yeah. And he's, he's talking about where he comes from, everything's better. Where he comes from, everything's bigger. Now, let me just apologize right now to anybody here who may be from Texas. Amen. I'm thinking that guy's from Texas, <laughs> and sure enough, he said something while he he was from Texas. So he and I'm just and he's coming, and I'm praying, Lord, please, please don't let him sit down by me. Yeah, yeah. See, because I know how God does things, and he does that to me a lot. God, please, I'm tired. God, you know, I'm, I, don't, I don't want a confrontation. Please, Lord, don't let him sit down beside me. And he walked past me. I thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. And he goes and he sits back almost in the back of first class. But he's talking, and he sits down, and he's still talking. I mean, talk, I look back, nobody's looking at him. He's just talking rude, crude kind of guy, loud. And, and we take off, he's still running that mouth as hard as he can go. We get up in the air, we've been flying a while. The, wet, the, the flight attendant comes to me, she says, sir, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. She said, that guy back there making all that and talking, to, we don't know who he's talking to. Do you know him? I said, what makes you think I know him? I, I listen, I, I mean, I, I'm, I was being nice. She said, well, he wears cowboy boots, and you wear cowboy boots. I said, you, so you think everybody in the world that wears cowboy boots knows each other? I said, I don't know who, I don't have a clue who he is. She said, well, he is the rudest. I said, yeah, I agree with you. He's got, you got my vote, okay? Listen, I, he didn't speak to me. I didn't speak. He didn't stop talking long enough to speak to anybody when he... I don't know who he is. So we're starting to come down to land, and I'm praying, Lord, help, let me get my stuff together. Let me get off this plane quick because, you know, I don't want any opportunity to have to talk to him. I, I mean, the whole, I've listened to him the whole flight. He, I look back, and the person sitting next to him was turned completely away from him. 
I get, get off, I mean, I'm the first one off the plane, and uh, I'm walking through the terminal there, the, the uh, concourse there, and, and I'm thinking, well, I got, got, by, got by that one, you know. Thank you, Lord. And, and then behind me, I hear this loud, hey, you. <laughs> now, I know my name's not hey, you, but who's not going to look? I turn around, and it was him. He said, yeah, you, yeah, wait a minute. So he gets to me. He says, I need to ask you something. He said, we on that plane I just got off of? I said, maybe. Because <laughs> I do not want to have a conversation with this man. Maybe. He said, oh, you are issue. I, yeah, I said, I said, yeah, I guess I was. <laughs> he said, I need to ask you. He said, what's wrong with you that affects your motor skills so? Now, who comes up to a complete stranger and asks that kind of stupid question? <laughs> Don't even know the guy. What's wrong with you that affects your motor skills so? Now, I tell people the greatest struggle I have as a Christian. You know, Paul said, after, even after he got saved, every day there was a war went on inside of him, the flesh against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. If Paul had that struggle, we'll all have that struggle. Amen? <clears throat> Listen, I tell, I tell people that's... My, my flesh, I call it, that's my resident redneck. I am possessed by a redneck. <laughs> that's, my, that's my flesh, my resident red. That one guy said, is his name Legion? I said, no, I think his name's Leroy. But anyway, <clears throat> most days I keep him beat down right well. But some days he can climb out. Some people can bring him out, out, out quicker than others too. So he, he started trying to climb out. Now what I wanted to say, listen to me, what I wanted to say to him idiot <laughs> what I wanted to say to him you want to know what affects what I have that affects my motors I said what, what do you mean my ability to work on cars what I got it. <laughs> it's what I wanted to say but fortunately I got him beat down before he got out my mouth what I did say was, well, if you have to know, I have a mild case of, of Tourette's. He said, I knew it. I said, then why did you ask me? Run me down in the concourse. What's wrong with your motor skills? And then he looks at me and he says, I need to tell you a few things. And his tone starts changing. I said, okay. He said, you're a preacher, aren't you? Yeah, thank you. Now, I, I don't travel like this. I, you know, it's hard enough to travel, but, it, but no, if I don't have to. I mean, I have my jeans, my shirt tail out. You know, I don't wear this thing on my forehead that says, yes, I'm a preacher, don't ask. <laughs> he said, you're a preacher, aren't you? I said, is that obvious? He said, oh, yeah, it's all over you. Okay. He said, you don't just pastor one church, do you? I said, no. He said, you travel all over and preach. Now, that's getting kind of creepy. Well, I don't know this guy. I said, yeah. He said, and God uses he, you, doesn't he? And I, I said, well, that's my heart. Uh, I want him to use me. He said, oh, he does. And then he said, God put you on that plane for me, didn't he? I said, well, I, I kind of hope, hope he puts me on every plane. I'm on and takes me off every plane. He said, no, no. He said, God put you on that plane for me. He said, let me tell you why. He said, I used to be in church. I used to live for the Lord. Oh, brother. But I had a younger brother who had a very severe case of Tourette's. His was violent. He twitched and, and, and jerked almost constantly. Not only would he not get out of the house, he wouldn't even get out of his room. When he was 16 years old, he could stand it no more. He took his own life. He said, I got mad and bitter at God. My God, let that happen to my little brother. And I've been running from him ever since. He said, but he's been dealing with me lately. And then on that plane, he pressed me that you were a preacher. And so he put you on that plane for me. He said, oh, can I say to you, thank you for getting out of your room. Thank you for not letting that defeat you and letting God use you. He said, I really need to get back to the Lord. He said, you got time you pray to pray with, pray with me? And, uh, yeah, I got time. Oh, yeah, yeah. Before I don't even meet, but I got all. I got. If I miss my flight, I've got time. Absolutely. I said, let's step away. This is a busy airport. I mean, people just 
coming through the concourse there. So we step over, and I just sit down in the chair. I think he just, well, he just gets on his knees on the floor, and he puts his head in the seat of that chair. So I, okay, so I get on my knees, put my, I said, I'll play, for, pray first, and you pray. Well, I pray, you know, first, and, and then he starts praying. Listen, apparently he didn't do anything softly. He starts praying out loud to the top of his lungs. I mean, he is crying, God, forgive me. I've been a sorry, rotten wretch, and I've been bitter, and I, I've hated God. I mean, and, and there's people, I mean, they're all, and I, and I can feel people coming up behind us. You, you know, and, and I'm kind of looking, there's people standing all back here. And I mean, he just keeps on praying. I guess he had a lot to confess. He just kept on praying. And, and I mean, and now I'm starting behind me, I'm starting to hear him say, hearing along, Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I'm thinking, man, we didn't have a revival right here in the airport. I mean, that's bound to be illegal. I mean, come on. When he finally finished praying, we stood up, and I looked back, and there was a crowd of people had gathered around behind us. That's what we, listen, they started hugging our neck and shaking our hands and kissing us on the cheek like it was some kind of family reunion. When they finally all got going, it was just me and him again. He gave me his business card. I gave him one of mine. He... He said, I appreciate you soon I get home. I'll tell my wife what I've done. And we're going to get in church. I promise we're going to get in church. I'm going to serve the Lord. I said, well, that's what you need to do. And he stayed in contact with me over the, over the last year or so and a half. And uh, not only did they get involved in a church, he and his wife both, they've now started a, a ministry for people with Tourette's. And uh, see, when God does things, he does it right. And all those years, I had prayed and begged God to take it away. I know he could if he wanted to. He could. But you know what? Satan tried to use that to discourage and defeat me that day. But God used it for his glory. And since that time, it's changed the way I pray about that. I no longer pray and ask God to take it away. Every day I say, God, thank you for Tourette's. God helps to keep me humble. Because yes. whatever you do with me, I know it's you and not me. It lets me minister to people that wouldn't listen to any other preacher. Right. Let me minister to people I'd never get a chance to minister to. Amen. God, thank you for Tourette's. You see, it's in his hands. My hands are off. When I stayed in my stay in the hospital almost five months ago, when I had the stroke, I mean, if you I prayed for me, I appreciate that so much. And uh, when my wife took me there, we didn't know what I was having, but I, had, I did have a stroke. And uh, the doctor who came in, name was Doctor Turkowitz, and uh, he asked me, he said, "Now these ticks you have?" He said, "Did you have those before the stroke?" I said, ask my wife. She said, Doc, I've known him since he was nine, and she, he was nine and I was eight. He's had him ever since I've known him. I said, all my life. He said, I'm a Tourette's doctor. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, he said you need to make an appointment. When you get out here, you get over this. He said, you make an appointment, come see me. I said, no, it's okay. He said, no, I mean, I said, no. He said, hey, listen, I, I won't even charge you. I said, well, thank you. That's so kind of you, but, but no thanks. He said, you mean you don't want me to take it? I said, no. I said, to be honest with you, I said, if you cure me of this, it'll mess up a couple of pretty good sermons I preach. <laughs> I said, my life for 59 years has adjusted to this, and this is part of who I am. So all I know how to be is who I am. I think it made him mad. <laughs> Wouldn't let him treat my Tourette's. And found out I was a preacher, and every time he'd leave my room, he'd go, bless him. Anybody know what that means? <laughs> but what I want you to understand today is yeah. I don't care who you are, right. where you come from, right. what you have or have not done, yes. what you have or do not have, yeah. what talents, gifts, or abilities you do or do not have, what mistakes you've made, or what things in your life that you think are the weaknesses and the mistakes of your life. I came this morning to tell you, if you'll just put it in Jesus' hands, take your hands off, he'll use you for his glory. The third thing about his lunch, and I'm done, not only the amount was it enough, the adequacy was it good enough, but the final thing was the availability of his lunch. 
until he made it available to Jesus to use. Jesus couldn't, wasn't going to meet the need of that multitude. The needs were met that day because a little boy made what he had available for Jesus to use. God may be waiting for you to make yourself available. If there's never been a time in your life that you put your life, everything you are and have and hope to be, the strengths and the weaknesses and even the mistakes... There's never been a time you put all that in Jesus' hands and said, Lord, it's yours. You do with it as you see fit. And then you take your hands off. Yeah. What are you waiting on? What are you waiting on? And Christian friend, listen to me. You know what I've learned as a Christian preacher? Sometimes life happens. Yeah. Problems arise. Circumstances come. And what I've done, I've been guilty of going back and putting my hands on some things that I once he put in his hands thinking I could handle it. You know what happens? I make a mess out of it every time. And I wind up having to run back and put it back in his hands all over again. Because he's the only one that can take care of us. He's the only one (laughs) that can make us adequate and enough for him to use to meet the needs of a multitude. Would you bow with me for prayer? Lord Jesus, I've been as transparent as I know how to be today. I've opened my heart in my life. We don't like talking about our weaknesses and things in our life we think might be the mistakes or the weaknesses, the flaws. But Lord, if you can use it to help somebody here today, some of these young people in here today, Lord, to help them to see now that you want to use them to give their life completely to you now. I wish I hadn't run from you all my teenage years. I wasted them in sin, in the world, for Satan. I could have had an influence in my public school. Mm -hmm. I could have led my friends to Jesus. I wasted it. I'll never get it back. So all I can do now is do everything I can do for you now. That's all you expect. Lord, no matter what the need may be today, with all that's in me, I felt like you've spoken to hearts of these sitting yes, here today. Yes, yes. Man, woman, boy, girl, young and God old. Bless. Every one of us, yes. Lord. And Lord, in this invitation, I pray as you speak to their heart, they'd be responsive. They would listen and they would respond. And come and put those things in your hand today. Some may need to come and put some things back in your hands today they've been trying to handle and they're making a mess or they're going to. Whatever it's a need for salvation, just to put their whole life in your hand for all eternity or as a Christian to just never done it, to just once and for all put it all there and leave it or just to come back and put some things back there that used to be there. And we'll thank you and we'll praise you for what you do in Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, would you stand quietly to your feet? They're going to begin to sing an invitation song. You don't need to sing. I want you focused on the Spirit of God, what He wants to do in your heart. God bless you. So as they sing this invitation song, and God's Spirit speaks to you, some things you need to put in His hands, don't wait and let Satan talk you out of it. Don't wait and worry about what somebody sitting next to you might think. You come on right now as they sing. It is no secret what God Back in his hands, coming to him now. The chimes of time bring out the news. Another day is through. Someone slipped and fell. Was that someone new? You may have long or added strength.
take him at his promise. Don't run away and hide. It is no Wasn't that wonderful? Yes, let's give him a hand.